going to tell you all how to ruin video games or else, well, I'll just tell you how I've been ruining video games and maybe if you like extrapolate from that, make it your own thing, you too can ruin video games. That's what we're all about. Yeah, so um, I'm Dietrich Squinkifer, Squinky for short. Um, if you like what I'm saying, tweet at the Squink. If you don't like what I'm saying, tweet at Tweed Couch Games. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, um, so yeah, I am the uh, artist in residence here um, until November 16th or so. Um, this is my gallery show called Well, This is Awkward, um, has a lot of awkward little games in it. Um, some of you may have seen them, but if you haven't, I definitely recommend that, uh, that you come check them out in the gallery. Um, but yeah, you may be wondering um, how exactly it was I, I got here, I got up to this point. Um, so yeah, when I was a wee babby um, game designer. Um, I was really into adventure games. Um, yeah, so um, I actually got my name Squinky from The Secret of Monkey Island. Um, and so like, I never was much of like a gamer gamer. Um, I think I was more of a reader than a gamer. And because of that, like, I really loved adventure games because uh, it was kind of like you're stepping into like a book or a movie um, and then you're just like interacting with it. You're controlling the outcome and you're like exploring. And uh, a lot of what like the uh, classic adventure games of uh, the like 90s uh, did was like really, really focus on putting you into a really cool story um, and letting you be the main character of that story. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed that. So unfortunately in like the early 2000s or so, um, adventure games died. Um, well, I don't think they died completely, but like they died according to the game industry because they weren't making a lot of money anymore compared to the, um, I guess, the 3D first-person shooter arms race. Um, so, like, um, so it used to be that adventure games were, like, uh, the thing that people showed to people, to, to, like, their friends, to show them, like, oh, this is how good my computer is. Look at it, playing all this, like, beautiful FMV and these beautiful, like, graphics for Myst and stuff. But then that got supplanted by, I guess, the more real-time, urgent, like, action-based shooty man stuff. Um, like, uh, yeah, so um, the Dooms, the Quakes, the Halos, etc. Um, and yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, like, Adventure Games died commercially, but, uh, that's when I got into making them just for fun. Um, that's when we, like, had a, uh, I guess I found a community of, uh, of, like, amateur game makers who, uh, and then some of them were, like, decided to make, uh, game engines that would, uh, let you make your own kinds of point-and-click adventure games. So, um, this is my first game. Um, it's called Cubert Bad Bone P.I. Um, I released it when I was 16. Um, I'm pretty proud of what 16-year-old me made. Um, yeah, it was, um, yeah, so uh, I actually recently, uh, semi-recently did a Let's Play of this game, and yeah, it's like, uh, while like, yeah, lots of the same usual like 16-year-old problems, it's like kind of like looking at ugly pictures of yourself from your high school yearbook, um, the game designer equivalent of that, um, it's actually like kind of cool, and like um, kind of cool to like, um, that there was a community of people who wanted to uh, like, play my uh, weird little games. Um, so, uh, so that was fun. And like, I liked game making so much that I decided to go to university and do a computer science degree. Um, obviously, like, I didn't go do a computer science degree that long ago, but still, um, yeah, so this was still the early 2000s. Um, like, I don't know, learned, uh, like, learned how to program in, in Java. No, not JavaScript, Java, um, <laughs> a, le a much less interesting, cool language. Um, but yeah, uh, <clears throat> so I became like 
a, a legit programmer because I figured like that was one of the best ways to get in the game industry and make uh, and make games for a living and uh, and then have my dream job. It's like because if if making games by myself is so much fun, then surely like making games in the game industry must be just as much fun, except they pay you, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so then, like, around the time I'm, like, in university, I come across uh, the, the story of E.A. Spouse. Um, so this is a famous um, live journal post by, um, by Aaron Hoffman, who, um, like, anonymously at the time wrote about, like, how her spouse was working long, long hours at E.A., and it was horrible, and, um, and like, just, and, uh, and people at EA exploited their employees and made them stay there forever. Um, and it wasn't that different, and the other like game companies weren't all that different, so it was kind of like a bit of a wake-up call for me, and I'm like, oh, whoa, what's this? What am I getting myself into? Do I still want to work in the game industry? I don't know, this is a little scary, but, but I love making games. I really, really do. Oh my God. Um, I don't know. So yeah, crushed, torn. So, but still I go I kind of like, um, it's like sort of my little warning cry, but, uh, but like I still go into it, like I still think I'm passionate about making games. Um, so like I go and, uh, and like go and get some game industry jobs. Um, so like, here is me in my early 20s um, as a um, young game designer. Um, I worked for uh, places like, like Telltale Games. Um, you probably know who they are. They got really, really big and famous and stuff. Uh, but back when they were a scrappy little startup, I was their programming intern. <laughs> um, and that was fun. And you can see me with the little like Sam and Max pirate puppet there. Um, I uh, later worked with with Ron Gilbert, the creator of The Secret of Monkey Island, um, on a game called Death Spank. Um, so there's another picture of me there. Um, and then there's like a picture of me at my first GDC with a coffee cup and, uh, and at a picnic for um, another game company called Backbone Entertainment where I, uh, where I worked on uh, a like bad shovelware Sonic the Hedgehog game. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was like, um, that was my time in the game industry, um, but yeah, like so, it wasn't it wasn't as horrible as I thought. It wasn't like um, like it wasn't terrible. They didn't make me work terrible long hours, but unfortunately, there were like a lot of microaggressions that I found, like drops in a bucket. So, um, so like, it would be just like the little things that would get to me, like. Um, discovering that like besides myself and the receptionist um it was only guys at the company of like at a company of like 30 people and that made me feel really weird because like like i said i'm kind of like just a junior programmer kind of just like there and it's like okay where where is everyone else why is it all dudes and mostly why is it all white dudes this is this is really really weird and yeah, so like every GDC I went to, every like uh, industry conference event, like yeah, it would be like mostly this big sea of white dudes like you see here. Um, to this day, it's really not that different. Not much has changed. Um, so like kind of um, in response to this, like uh, I joined some like women in games um, initiatives. But even those ones, like even doing that kind of stuff was hard. Like I didn't really feel um, like comfortable among big groups of women either. It was strange. And like, like again, it's like a lot of like conventionally like cisgender femme women who perform womanhood like you're supposed to. Um, and like later on, I would go on to realize that I'm genderqueer um, and that uh, my gender expression doesn't necessarily fit in the gender binary. So yeah, that was um, hard. I mean, like women in games uh, associations are really, really necessary, but at the same time, there's all these other people. It does, it's not a one size fits all kind of thing for everyone. Um, and yeah, like, plus, besides that, I didn't really fit a particular, like, gamer demographic. Like, um, 
I mean, like, uh, by this time in game industry history, like, the games you release are all about your target audience. Um, if you, uh, if any of you were at the GTFO panel yesterday, um, we were talking about audiences and just like how dividing people into like uh, demographics based on age and gender and, and all that stuff, it's like uh, really like uncomfortable at best and downright horrifying at worst. And like, so the thing is like, um, if you don't really fit neatly into a bunch of little boxes, uh, then nobody makes games for you. Like when you're a game maker, you have to make games for like some hypothetical imagined like other group of people that you don't understand. Um, you're not making, you can't make games for yourself, God forbid, because people like you don't actually exist um, according to marketers, so. So there you have it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, hard, difficult. Um, yeah. So I re I got really into feminism around this time, and like uh, I started to um, really get into um, like I. I uh, helped some friends of mine form a website called The Border House. Um, it was this really like, it was this really popular um, gaming blog, um, like this feminist gaming blog um, that was kind of from the like, around like 2009 to like maybe 2012, 2013. And uh, a lot of like now famous like, um, feminist game journalists um, got their start there, um, like uh, like Catherine Cross and Samantha Allen, and uh, oh my God, so many people. Maddie Bryce, um, yeah, lots of lots of big names um, who are like big household names in uh, in games today. Like actually, like got started at the Border House, which is really cool. And so I'm glad I was like part of that initiative. And yeah, so like gone into um, social justice -y stuff, um, didn't make me super popular with people in the game industry because like it seemed to them like I was complaining a lot when really what I was trying to do was make things better. And I was also kind of young, so like uh, I, it was, uh, yeah, lots of miscommunications there. Um, so yeah, I didn't last super long in the game industry because of it. Um, and then also like there was a recession happening. Um, and so like around like around this time, um, like uh, a lot of what happened in the game industry during the recession was like at first people were like, oh, games are recession proof. We are fine. La di da. And yet like and people like start losing money anyway. And then uh, kind of like at companies where people were really like trying to be innovative in the first place, they kind of like discover that uh, actually um, maybe this isn't working. Maybe we don't have enough money for this. Maybe we should go and do something like that. It'll be guaranteed to sell a bit better. Um, oh yeah, Squinky, you're fired, bye. <laughs> yeah, so there's that. Um, and yeah, so like um, I was kind of like getting really frustrated, um, I guess, with games that are, I guess, about like challenges and surmounting challenges. Um, like, uh, and I kind of wanted to make more games that were about making interesting choices instead. Um, so, um, so I discovered actually like interactive fiction. Um, so, uh, as it turns out, like there was this community of people I didn't know about um, who just like, like in a way parallel to how um, after adventure games commercially died, like uh, myself and other people started making them of our own. Um, so like 10 years before that, um, like so text adventures by Infocom um, were a really big thing. And then after that, they commercially died. And then people like um, reverse engineered uh, the uh, like the the Z machine system and uh, and made their own and like had developed these authoring tools to uh, make their own text adventure games. And once they kind of got past the whole thing of like copying Infocom type games, people started to experiment a bit more and make games where you like talk to statues. Um, yeah. 
great games. Or like, uh, or like where you're a boy at boarding school and, uh, and like you uh, can't say all the things you want to say and it's frustrating and sad. Um, yeah, so this was kind of like really inspiring to me in my own like graphical work. Um, so I made things like games about people like having conversations on the park bench or like, um, or like games where um, like you play, uh, you play the minion of a fantasy villain and, um, and then you try to uh, like have this branching storyline um, with moral ambiguity. And uh, yeah, I made, and then I also made like Twine games in HTML before Twine existed. Um, so it was just like hyperlink kinds of like web page games. And, uh, and that was cool. And like, so with the goal of just like exploration and not necessarily seeking out goals. Um, and so I worked on that stuff. Um, and then like people would be would play it and be like, oh, this is interesting. Uh, I don't think this is really a game though. Are you sure this is a game? Um, and a little did I know that this argument would actually like turn out to be a lot more political later on. So, um, so there was that. Um, I made a game um, that I released on my 25th birthday called Life Flashes By, which was about um, a uh, middle-aged novelist going through a near-death experience and uh, reliving episodes of her life, um, and, uh, and then exploring like ways things could have gone differently. Um, and then it was kind of like, uh, like while I was making this game, I had gotten laid off from a job and uh, was kind of like having the quarter life crisis and like questioning my future and my place in it. So um, yeah, that's like, and then I was also like starting to question my gender around this time too. So like it's about my like discomfort with the idea of like, like um, being assigned as a woman and uh, the expectations that people place on women and things like that. So. Uh, <laughs> That was um, that was a thing I made an interesting like time capsule of that time, um, and then the year, a year later um, I wrote uh, I wrote a game called The Play where um, you are the director of uh, of a play that um, is kind of like in at, like horrible shambles and uh, you need to get like your uh, you need to get your actors together and uh, and then like uh, so it kind of like um, starts off seeming like uh, just kind of more of like a noises off style slapstick comedy kind of thing and I was really inspired by that but then there's also like this uh, this sexual harassment subplot that I wanted to explore as well so it's kind of this thing like you go in there expect a comedy and then it's like wham oh we're dealing with some serious issues here and uh, it was pretty well received and uh, I was kind of I was pretty proud of the way I handled that um, yeah so this was called the play um, so, so that like around that year um, was when the um, when the Penny Arcade Dick Wolves debacle happened. Which, again, if you were at the GTFO screening, um, that was detailed uh, in detail there. But uh, yeah, basically, um, like like. Um, Penny Arcade made a rape joke in their comic strip. Um, some very dear friends of mine um, like protested against it and got like horribly, horribly harassed for it. Um, and uh, yeah, you could say it was a precursor to, um, I guess, the more recent awfulness of Gamergate that happened last year. Um, again, lots and lots of my friends were targeted. I was like in a state of heightened panic, worried about whether like I would be targeted myself because like I know and am connected with a lot of people. Um, like fortunately it didn't get so bad, but it was still really, really traumatizing. And uh, it's been traumatizing for a lot of us. And uh, I feel like our community has really, really been trying to rebuild itself since. And, uh, and I mean like, it's still happening, like the harassment and abuse is still happening, um, it's not going away. Um, but in the meantime, like on a brighter note, um, like, a like 
after, uh, like, sometime in between, like, um, I guess, like, movement started happening um, as, like, I guess, documented and codified in, uh, in this book by Anna Anthropy, um, which I recommend reading if you haven't already. It's in your library. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so this book was written in, like, only... 2012, I think. Um, it wasn't uh, so like, uh, so it was like this um, kind of resulted in this awesome explosion of uh, queer, trans, people of color, um, disabled people, like um, writing these awesome games about. Uh, about their life experiences. And with the availability of, uh, of tools like twine and game maker and construct and stuff like like it's it's easier than uh, it ever was before for like somebody to just like pick up some tools and make a game and make a game about their lives and uh, and that's been really beautiful and really inspiring to me um, so kind of like in response um, to all this I made this game called uh, Dominique Pomplamous in It's All Over Once the Fat Lady Sings, which is actually available to play in the gallery. Um, check it out if you haven't already. Um, so uh, this was, um, a, this is a game about like um, a, uh, a detective who um, is neither male nor female and people keep asking them about it and it's awkward and weird. Um, and it's also like a stop motion game and it's also a musical game so everybody sings um by everyone i mean like all the characters are voiced for me so it's me singing an awful lot and also playing instruments um yeah needless to say like um a lot of gamer bros weren't happy about this game's existed nor were they happy about the fact that um it got nominated for a lot of awards <laughs> so uh yeah, this is like my most successful game to date, um, both like in a uh, professional and a personal sense because this is like, this, this is the game um, like where I came out as genderqueer and really started to um, become like more visible about my identity and, uh, and like non-binary genders and how they are a thing. And, and it even like encouraged like a lot of people I know to like, come out, discover they have similar feelings themselves, and, and I guess, like, we have, we have more visibility for that now, and I'm glad I got to kind of, like, help with that in my own small, tiny way. So, yeah, um, I mentioned twine earlier, and um, so one thing, yeah, one thing that's really cool about twine is uh, that, like, it's literally just about choices. It's um, not necessarily like so much about challenges and uh, a lot of games made um, a lot of games made in twine subvert like um, traditional notions of uh, challenge difficulty um, and uh, like and because of this a lot of people like like I said like it's like is this really a game and I'm like yeah of course it is if it self-identifies as a game then it's a game as far as I'm concerned that's my definition um, so um, if you're like, um, if you're game designers, um, if you like have any formal game design training, um, you may be familiar with this, uh, with this graph. Um, it is like, uh, it is about the, like, it's describing the flow state um, as uh, like, as written about by uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi um, in uh, 1994 in his book, Flow. Um, and uh, it's des describing how, like, uh, to create an optimal experience, um, and then this, like, and this, like, uh, optimal experience is like uh, seen by uh, lots of like professional game designers as like the holy grail of game designers game design, um, like, you have to create an optimal experience. You have to have this, like, perfect balance of, uh, of challenge versus skill, um, and it has to be, like, within this flow channel. If you make things too, like, if you give them too much challenge when they don't have enough skill, you create anxiety, um, and when you, like, don't give them enough challenge, you give them boredom, and you don't ever want to go outside of the flow channel, no siree. 
but, um, but actually what a lot of games are doing is in fact using things like uh, anxiety and boredom to create like negative as well as positive emotional reactions in players. Um, like in film, TV, music, literature, etc., cetera, we, um, we use devices in those particular media to, um, to like put us through a roller coaster of emotions. Why can't we use gameplay to do the same? And like, not just, uh, and not just like trying to like convey emotions through cutscenes, but making the gameplay kind of this one note flow state challenge reward kind of mechanism. But, uh, but why don't we use gameplay to create different emotional states? Um, yeah, and then like, um, so Maddie Bryce wrote a thing called Death of the Player, which uh, I thought was really inspiring um, because like, it's like, all right, well, maybe to like, um, like games are for players, but they don't necessarily need to be like pleasing the player all the time. And uh, maybe a strength that games have is like to create de deliberately uncomfortable states in players. Um, and, uh, and maybe that's like an expressive potential that games have really like yet to realize. Um, and like, uh, I guess like smaller marginalized developers are doing it, but it has yet to like triple, trickle up to um, like AAA and things like that. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about some games I've made since. Like, uh, so this is like, this is Queen's Quest Seven: The Death of Video Games. Um, it is a, uh, a twine piece that I wrote in uh, response to Gamergate. Um, I wrote it a month after it happened for a game jam called Ruin Jam, um, and because we're ruining video games. And yeah, so, um, so yeah, it's like kind of like this, uh, this um, like little space op, the space opera, um, it's really, really queer, um, and yeah, it's about like um, your home planet video games has exiled you, um, even though that's like where you're from and uh, what you were born to do, and yeah, that mirrored a lot of my feelings, as you can imagine. Um, it involves like, um, like dancing in order to evade the police and make them explode into glitter. Um, adorable also it's also in the gallery so check it out um, this is a game I wrote called interruption junction where you are uh, in a conversation with three of your I guess friends acquaintances I don't know if they're really your friends because they just kind of like talk on and on about like things you don't care about and then you can interrupt them by like button mashing. Um, when you interrupt them, you like start talking about like uh, video games you played and describe them in great detail. And that of course like bores them. Um, so it's kind of like one of those things where no matter what you do, the outcome is sad either way. If you don't like, uh, if you stop talking, then you fade away and disappear. If you like keep talking, then the other people fade away and disappear. And if you try to keep the conversation going, like it doesn't really mean anything. The text scrolls by too fast, uh, even so. And uh, it's and like the sound effects are all like blah 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 blah. And so yeah, gibberish. Um, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, it's a silly but sad game. Also in the gallery, check it out. Um, this is a game I wrote for Global Game Jam earlier this year called Thirty Six Questions, um, where it's the end of the world, and um, you play with a fictional future version of me, um, who suggests going through um, the like. 36 questions that uh, some uh, psychologists developed that can make anyone fall in love with each other if you ask them. Um, and so like I made it um, a twine game where uh, you can input all your responses but the game doesn't save them um, because like if I got to see the responses it would break the space-time continuum, right? Um, I actually like invited people to take screen caps of uh, of the like uh, of their responses of the game to send to me. Um, only one person did. <laughs> that was interesting. 
Um, this is a game I wrote called uh, Tentacles Growing Everywhere. It is about um, three teenage aliens going through their version of puberty, um, which means different things from our puberty because like, um, in this species, all of the children look the same um, until they are about like 13 years old or so. And then they start like developing like tentacles on different parts of their bodies, which then determines what role they play in society. And so like there are these three friends who all get shipped off to different schools and, um, and they feel really weird about it because now they're not with their friends anymore. And yet like they're, like have to make new friends and they don't necessarily fit in and it's weird. Um, and so it was kind of like my way of like, this is like my version of like a Judy Bloom or Babysitter's Club book, um, my attempt at young adult fiction. Um, it, was, it was fun to write. Um, this is uh, Conversations We Have in My Head, um, which you, some of you might have played back at my booth at the back over there. Um, it is like, so um, you play like a character having a conversation with their um, estranged ex, only um, their ex is actually like not in the conversation. Um, it's like revealed at the end that uh, they're just imaginary. Um, and so it's kind of like, uh, like all these permutations of like things that um, like you wish you could say to someone you've been estranged from for a long time. Um, and also like, uh, I don't know, the, the uncomfortable feeling of like somebody knowing you when you were like a past version of yourself and uh, that feeling really, really uncomfortable. Um, and this is Fitzwilliam Darcy's Dance Challenge, also at the back over there, which some of you may have played. Um, it is like one of the meanest games I've ever written. Um, it is like um, almost, like, al like very difficult, almost impossible to, uh, to play unless you like really, really try. But even then, it's not a very satisfying experience. Uh, the real way to win the game is to figure out that you can kill Mr. Darcy by stepping on his foot, like, a lot of times. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, the, the patriarchy is a game that, uh, that you can't really win, um, not, at least not by following the rules. Uh, that was kind of like the procedural rhetoric I was trying to get at here. Um, and this is Coffee and Misunderstanding, which is um, like a unique thing that I've done in that it's, a, uh, it's actually an interactive theater performance. Um, so uh, I get members of the audience to, um, to like act out um, these two characters who, um, who meet in a coffee shop and who know each other from, the, from online and uh, have like, and have a conversation, and meanwhile, like some other members of the audience get to um, actually choose what lines they say. Um, so I'll actually be running um, a game of that later over in the back there um, after Magical Girl Olympics happens, um, which I also recommend you play. It's fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is uh, this is Coffee and Misunderstanding. And yeah, okay, and. Um, so that's, that's all I have to say. Uh, anyone got any questions?